much better. That's awesome. That is awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy Election Day. Thank you so much for the chance to gather here at the Ohio State House and talk about how things are going in Ohio. First, to uh, look back to the spring, as you remember, way back in March and April, we, we started to roll up our sleeves and figure out how are we going to run a presidential election in the midst of a pandemic. Obviously, this is a historic election, one unlike anything we've ever seen, and we keyed in on a few key uh, priorities, really from the very beginning. Uh, one was recruiting massive numbers of poll workers. We knew that we needed to launch an unprecedented poll worker recruitment effort that has been enormously successful. As you know, we've recruited and trained over 56,000 poll workers who were standing ready this morning at 6.30 a.m. to open close to 4,000 polling locations all throughout the state. This may be the year that we recruited that new generation of poll workers. Maybe a silver lining from this experience is that this great and energetic new group of poll workers that we were able to bring into this important civic process. Of course, one of the other things that we focused on from the very beginning is the health and safety priorities that needed to be put in place. As you all know, we worked with the CDC and the Ohio Department of Health, listening to those professionals, scientists, doctors, and epidemiologists that guided us as we created a 61-point a, a checklist. A 61-point checklist that was employed today at every polling location throughout the state and all throughout the last month at all of our early voting sites. Along with that 61-point health and safety checklist was the fielding of massive quantities of personal protective equipment. As you know, many Ohio companies stepped up and donated hand sanitizer and masks. We used our CARES dollars to purchase uh, the remaining needed quantities of that. And every polling location throughout the state is stocked today with the equipment that they need. Of course, one of the other priorities was combating disinformation, making sure that Ohioans had reliable and accurate information. That's been another success, and we can point to uh, some success stories there where we've been able to track down uh, and bring to justice uh, a group of individuals that were engaging in a pernicious act of disinformation. Of course, this is something that we remain constantly vigilant about, but happy to report that uh, we're not seeing any major incidents of that today throughout Ohio, but again, we, we remain constantly on the watch for it. And then, of course, maximizing early and absentee voting was one of our other top priorities. I think it's safe to say that uh, you can call this nothing other than a resounding success when we had 3.4 million ballots that had already been cast before the polls even opened this morning at 6.30 a.m. 3.4 million Ohioans who had already voted. This is by far a record-breaking participation rate for early and absentee voting and something that we were very happy to see, something that we really started off uh, from the very beginning working to encourage. As you know, not only with a lot of public information campaigns that we did to spread the word about the convenience of early and absentee voting, but also with mailing out an absentee ballot request to all 8 million registered voters in the state. And by the way, that's, that's another one. The fact that we surpassed 8 million registered voters in the state of Ohio is a... Uh, another big success story. Of course, um, all of this preparation culminated in this morning when the polls opened all throughout Ohio, close to 4,000 locations opening up at 6.30 a.m. And um, I'm happy to report that as we stand here today, election day in Ohio is going smoothly so far. Of course, as with any election, when you've got that many polling locations in a big diverse state like Ohio, there are gonna be a few things here and there. And we've experienced uh, throughout the day and starting from early this morning, a couple little bumps in the road that we've been able to work through with our county boards of elections. And thankfully, because of having the right contingency plans in place, uh, again, happy to report that things are going smoothly. Uh, as many of you know, this morning at 5.36 a.m., we were notified by the Franklin County Board of Elections that they were experiencing problem problems uploading voter data into their electronic poll books. Of course, that's a process that goes on overnight when the early voting stops at 2 p.m. yesterday, then the task begins of loading that data into those electronic poll books. The decision was made by the Franklin County Board of Elections at 536 this morning uh, that they couldn't wait any longer for that upload to continue, and they decided to switch over to the backup plan. Now, let's talk about that quite, uh, quite uh, important detail right there. Uh, we issued a directive back in July that required every Board of Elections to have this backup plan in place. To be clear, what that is is just the old three-ring binders, the paper check-in books that had been used in this state for many decades. And so when Franklin County needed to make that decision this morning at 5.30 a.m., they were ready to switch over to that. And again, that was because of the contingency planning that we did working with our county boards of elections to make sure that we had a backup plan in place. 
This is why we have backup plans. I'm uh, happy to say that uh, the County Boards of Elections were able to use their CARES Act money to make purchases like this. Initially, some of the boards said, well, now we got to go out and buy all these three ring binders and we got to print all these pieces of paper. Well, again, that's where that federal money uh, came in handy. Uh, another incident that I uh, wanted to report in Greene County. Uh, in Greene County, we were made aware this morning that uh, there were some voting machines that were not functioning. This was in Bellbrook. Uh, in that scenario, the vendors that supply those uh, voting machines uh, were mobilized and were almost immediately on site to work to correct the issue. Those machines are now up and running. Uh, of course, during the time that they were down, the Board of Elections again had the backup plan of switching over to paper ballots. That's something that uh, all the Boards of Elections are prepared to do. And again, something that we directed them to do to have that backup plan of having paper ballots available. And again, so in this case, uh, that uh, backup plan worked. The machine that, uh, was, uh, that was not functioning properly at that time was a Dominion ImageCast X machine, but again, happy to report that those are back up and running. Um, also want to reiterate something about the 100-foot buffer around polling locations. As you all know, polling locations have a special designation under law for a reason. These are places where voters come to cast their ballots, where poll workers carry out this important civic function. And Within 100 foot feet of that polling location, no kind of political activity is allowed to occur. Of course, voters have been instructed not to wear hats or shirts with their favorite candidate's uh, slogan on it. And, and when you know enthusiastic voters show up wearing a shirt or a hat with their favorite candidate's slogan on it, they'll be dealt with uh, in a professional and friendly manner by the County Board of Elections personnel, the, the poll workers that are there. And, and they've been trained to help de-escalate that situation and talk through people uh, and, and why that is important, but of course, of course, nobody is ever turned away. Uh, something else that uh, that 100-foot uh, barrier designates is that outside of that 100-foot zone, people are free to express their, their First Amendment protected speech rights. They can pass out uh, flyers and, and uh, hold signs and that kind of thing, but what will never be tolerated, and you all have heard me say this loud and clear, is any kind of intimidation or obstruction, anything that causes voters to be delayed uh, that will not be tolerated, and, and of course our law enforcement personnel continue to stand ready uh, should somebody try to engage in such illegal activity. But again, happy to report that we're not getting any, any reports of that. Also uh, want to report a few anecdotes, and these are the things that happen when, again, 56,000 people at 4,000 voting locations all throughout the state are serving you know, millions of registered voters. Uh, in Tuscarawas County early this morning, a um, a poll worker left behind the keys necessary to uh, activate the voting machines. They were back at the Board of Elections. Well, a quick thinking sheriff's deputy got in his patrol vehicle and ran lights and sirens all the way back to the, uh, to the Board of Elections office to retrieve those keys and only cost a few minutes time. And thankfully, they were able to get that location up and running. That's, uh, again, the kind of quick thinking and, and really patriotic uh, and creative service that people render on Election Day. Uh, in Hamilton County, we were happy to see photos this morning of a large room where they have their reserve poll workers. These are the folks that are trained and ready to go. They're standing by at the Board of Elections uh, in case they need to be called into service. This was something that we very intentionally did as a state. We told our Boards of Elections that they needed to not only recruit and train that 37,000 bare minimum, but they needed to go 50% above that. And so if your county Board of Elections normally relies on 1,000 poll workers, we told you to have 1,500 trained and standing by and ready to go. This is a manifestation of that right there in Hamilton County. And um, also wanted to point out that there was one county that was one poll worker short this morning. We got a call from them. Uh, they needed a poll worker. They didn't have somebody ready to fill those shoes. And so we reached out to a nonprofit that we've been working with called Poll Hero. Poll Hero is a nonprofit group that was started by a group of college students to recruit poll workers nationwide. We formed a great partnership with them early on, and they were responsible for a lot of poll worker recruitment in Ohio. Well, Poll Hero went into their database. They found somebody that had volunteered in that county. They got them on the phone bright and early this morning, got them down to the Board of Elections, quickly trained up and out at the polling location. And as we speak, that poll worker who we were able to, to, to locate early this morning is uh, is running a polling location or helping to run a polling location here in Ohio. That's uh, awesome news. Uh, also, uh, something that happened in Miami County, and really this is a compliment to their Board of Elections. There was unfortunately a woman who ran her car into the polling location and actually damaged the wall. You can see from photos uh, where the, the wall is clearly uh, cracked. And uh, thankfully, the woman who ran her car into the polling location was okay. And she was able to cast her ballot actually before leaving the scene. 
And I'm happy to also report that voting continued at that polling location. The fire department came down and inspected it. They said that the building is safe to continue operating. Of course, it's going to require some repair in the future. But these are the kind of things that happen, again, in a big state like ours. And thankfully, because of the, the, th the thoughtful work of the Board of Elections there in Miami County, they were able to continue voting there. Everybody kept a cool, calm head. They called in the uh, public safety professionals to look at the building. And again, the woman was OK and able to cast her ballot. So what to expect tonight? Uh, you all have heard me talking for some time about the way that election night reporting works in Ohio. And so here's the bottom line. Starting at 7.30 tonight, our boards of elections, actually at 7.31, will immediately begin to tabulate their ballots. And, and the very first ballots counted in most cases will be those early and absentee ballots. It's intuitive why our boards of elections have been processing those for weeks now. Now, contrast that to some of our neighboring states like Pennsylvania and Michigan, where they weren't even allowed to start cutting open envelopes until today. And in those states, they're going to have a delay because counting all of those ballots is going to take time when they just now started today. But again, thankfully in Ohio, we've been processing, processing absentee ballots since the 6th of October. There's a few key things to point out about that. Because we started processing ballots on the 6th of October, the boards of elections could contact voters that made an error, that forgot their signature. They could send them the form in the mail that they need in order to cure their ballot and start that process of working with voters. And of course, again, all of those uh, ID envelopes have been processed. They verified the identification information, checked the signature against the signature on file, accepted those ballots, and they'll be ready to process right at 7.30. Um, why this is important to point out is that you'll see results start pretty early in Ohio as those early and absentee ballots get tallied and then around, you know, 8.30, 8.45 at night as the precinct locations start to get their ballots down to the Board of Elections, you'll see those begin processing. Of course, the thing that could lead to a delay tonight is if a Board of Elections receives a large delivery of mail today. If the postal truck shows up today with tens of thousands of ballots on board, then yes, that will cause them to have to have a, a little bit longer night. Uh, but those are things that we have worked to, uh, to mitigate, and we've been reminding Ohioans for weeks now to return their absentee ballots. In fact, happy to say that as of last night, the number of outstanding absentee ballots was uh, 243,023. And my hope is that many of those 243,023 Ohioans have returned their absentee ballots today. The reminder is you've got to get it to your Board of Elections before 7.30 tonight. Every Board of Elections now, for the first time ever in a general election, has a secure 24-7 drop box so that you can drop it off there. And those will be emptied promptly at 7.30. So of course, uh, those uh, late arriving absentee ballots could cause a delay. But what will happen later on in the night is that we will report an accurate but incomplete number. Now, let me, let me di di deconstruct that a little bit for you. What we're going to report is going to be an accurate number, but it's not going to be the final story. And as you all understand, and I've gotten these questions over the last couple of weeks, will we have a final number on election night? Well, the answer is, of course not, because we never have a final number on election night. That's just not how election night reporting works. It never has been. Uh, but what we will have is an accurate number of everything that's been received so far up until this date. Every absentee vote, every early vote, and every in-person election day vote will be tabulated and reported tonight as part of our unofficial tabulation. One of the other things that we're going to report is the number of outstanding ballots. And that's something for you to watch on our election night reporting website. We're highlighting that for the first time ever. We've reconfigured that website to put that right at the top, the number of outstanding absentee ballots. Again, that 243,000 plus uh, whatever provisional ballots were cast today. There's a reason why that's important. We know that a large number of those absentee ballots will come in over the next 10 days. Of course, boards of elections can receive ballots up until, the, uh, up until and through the 13th of November, as long as they were postmarked by Monday, November 2nd. And we know that every legally cast ballot must be counted and will be counted. That's how we do it here in Ohio. That's what the law says. And so tonight, you're going to get a snapshot in time, but the final number will come weeks later. Now, the question is, will tonight's number be conclusive? Well, that'll be up to you to look at that number and make a determination. Again, if your favorite candidate's ahead by a million votes and there are yet 200,000 outstanding absentee ballots, I think you can look at that and say that that contest is over. But if your favorite candidate's ahead by 100,000 votes and there are still 200,000 outstanding absentee ballots, well, then just by definition, uh, that contest is not going to be over until we have the time to count every single ballot. Again, when the numbers change between the unofficial report on election night and the final certified tally that comes a few weeks later, that's not a sign of something nefarious. In fact, far from it. It's a manifestation of that commitment that you hear every elections official make, that every voice matters and every legally cast ballot must be counted. And so that's exactly what we'll do here in Ohio. Again, I uh, want to finish with this. Uh, really just remarkable numbers that we reported yesterday. 3.4 million Ohioans haven't already cast their ballot 
really prove something that we've known for a long time. Ohio is a leader when it comes to early and absentee voting. Ohio is a state where we intentionally have made it over the last several years easy to vote. Ohioans are proving that by participating in record numbers. You see the quote from Lincoln over there. That's something that I uh, printed up and we taped up all over the office a few weeks ago. It's one of my favorite. And it was as true then as it is today that the elections belong to the people and it's their decision. And that's exactly what we're having here in Ohio today and what we will have in Ohio is a free and fair election where every voice can be heard in an honest contest. With that, I look forward to taking any questions that you all have. Secretary, uh, can you tell us whether there is any outstanding litigation going on right now in Ohio? Yeah, not at this time. In fact, uh, you know, one of the good things that we've been able to do is build friendly relationships with some of these organizations, voting rights groups, and that kind of thing that have a history of litigation with this office. And, and because of that sort of friendly relationship, we're able to talk to one another and exchange text messages. In fact, I was just on the phone with Tom Roberts from the NAACP and with Andre Washington from the A. Philip Randolph Institute. We have a great working relationship and, and a common goal and mission in mind, by the way, as well. And so, no, there's nothing that we know of. Of course, we're always ready for that, and that's something that we know is just a, a part of life here in Ohio. Jesse? Hi. I, I have a couple numbers questions. Do we have how many people have voted today or an estimate of how many people have voted today? That's not a number that, that we'll have until after 730. The, the, the most recent numbers we have was, was were put out in that uh, press release that we sent out yesterday with 3.4 million absentee ballots cast. Okay. And those 3.4 .4 million, are those all processed and like ready to be counted at 731? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, again, that's the good news story is that in Ohio, we're able to process those and, and be ready to count them right away. And so again, those boards of elections have been processing those for weeks now. Uh, actually, I uh, was just handed a note that uh, Franklin County got their mail today and they had 4,000 new absentee ballots that came in today. Now contrast that to back in April, on election day, they received 20,000 ballots, and obviously it takes time to cut open 20,000 envelopes to proof 20,000 ID envelopes, check 20,000 signatures, et cetera. So I'm happy to report actually that that number that came in today at Franklin County is 4,000, and we'll see how many come into their drop box as well. And one quick Please. one. Do you know how many of those absentee ballots were invalid or had problems with them? Yeah, so we've been getting that question as well. Uh, let's talk about the, the curing process. Uh, so we don't have numbers yet for how many uh, had problems with them. That will be something that will be reported after the election and something that we look at very carefully as we do sort of our after action review. That's a military term that I use, but AAR is sort of our habit of going through and looking at what went wrong, what went right, how we can sustain good things for the future and improve bad things. Uh, one of the things that we'll do is study that, but we were very intentional this year about improving the absentee balloting process because we knew we were going to see more first time absentee voters than we'd ever seen. And that means more people that were inexperienced at it. That's why we redesigned the envelopes. Hopefully you've seen those. We redesigned the instruction sheet, much, made it much more intuitive. The old one was a bunch of legal jargon. It was really hard to read quite candidly. And we took it and redesigned it as a checklist and made it much more easy to understand. One of the other key things that we did is we've directed the boards of elections to pick up the phone or get on their computer and email the voter if there's a problem. And that's why filling out that a phone number and email address on your absentee ballot request form is so important. If there's a mistake made, the Board of Elections can contact the voter. Now, that doesn't replace the paper copy. They need hard copies still. They have to mail something to you so you can get your signature on it or ask you to come down to the Board of Elections. But that phone call can, can help start the process. And so I believe that we're going to see a better than, than past records for uh, sort of the cure rate and being able to, to fix those errors. And remember, that continues for seven days after the election. Adrian. Are you prepared tonight to possibly need to defend the results if, if there are claims that they're inaccurate? Um, and then do you still believe that Ohioans will accept the results once they are out, even if they are unofficial tonight? Yeah, I believe they will. And, and, and what, um, what drives that belief is my knowledge of how elections are structured in Ohio. And it starts at the local level with these really dedicated bipartisan teams that do the work. 
It, uh, it, it continues to the transparency that's built into the process. As I always say, in elections, there's nothing to hide. Everything is an open book. You can go and, and tour the Board of Elections and see what's happening and observe the process. And even some boards, for example, because uh, their facilities are too small to allow people in for social distancing purposes, they're, they're, they're going to do a, a webcast of, of, the, of the tabulation process for anybody that wants to watch that. Some of the county boards have made that decision. And so again, everything's very transparent in elections. But ultimately, for you know, our entire history, um, we've had this very good history in this country of understanding that when the people speak, the elected officials need to listen, right? And we respect that what we hear today will be the true voice of the people of Ohio. And anybody that tries to call into question the validity of Ohio's process just simply doesn't understand the process. Um, I will defend Ohio's process and the voice of the people of Ohio uh, because I know it's a good process. And again, we won't have final results tonight. And so if it is a narrow margin uh, between one candidate or the other, and simply speaking, uh, we may have to wait more time before we hear what the people of Ohio fully had to say. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Secretary, to your left. Yes, sir. Um, last night, you had tweeted something about uh, an investigation into voter intimidation, something you brought up again today. There was somebody who apparently was joking on social media about working at a poll location, throwing ballots away. You said that was investigated. Could you elaborate on what the investigative process is for those situations? And you kind of touched on it there, but do you worry that that could damage the confidence in the system or undermine the process when things like that are out there in this age where people are able to say whatever they want on any forum. Yeah. Well, that's why specifically we react so quickly to these kind of things. Voter confidence is one of the most important responsibilities I have, and maintaining that rightful confidence that people should have in our process is something that we focus on absolutely every single day. Of course, beyond that, there's no such thing as any tolerable level of voter fraud or, or voter intimidation or suppression. The good news is those things are rare. They're rare because we keep them rare and we react and we take them seriously. Now, we find out about these things through a variety of different ways, but interestingly, most often we find out, find out on social media. Sometimes we also find out because of the relationships we've built with uh, members of the community. I mean, I was very intentional over the last year and a half about going around the state and doing disinformation training with minority community leaders. And we were doing them in person back when that was possible, and then we transitioned them to be, to be virtual. But it was a, a briefing about understanding what is different dis disinformation, how to combat it, how to report it. As a result of those relationships we built, that's how we found out about the uh, this, honestly, this racist robocall that was happening in Cleveland weeks ago. We were, it was reported to us by an alert voter who said something's wrong here, and they went to report at ohiosos.gov, that's the email address, and they reported it to us and to their member of Congress. We worked with uh, their, their member of, of Congress as well, uh, and as a result, there was that there, there is now a criminal indictment, and there will be hopefully a prosecution for this. Uh, the, the issue last night, um, you know, what, what happened when we found out about it is that we immediately got on the phone with the Franklin County Board of Elections where this person claimed to have been a poll worker. Thankfully, we were able to find out that they were in fact not a poll worker. They were somebody that was shooting off on social media about something that they thought was funny, which is not funny. You know, talking about uh, tampering with people's sacred right to vote is something that we consider no laughing matter. And that's why we respond aggressively like that, to make it clear. Just like the incident that happened uh, where there was a, a person that claimed to be an Ohio State student, probably wasn't, it was an anonymous account, but claimed to be an Ohio State student who was going around the dorms and throwing away people's ballots if they were known supporters of a candidate that they didn't like. We aggressively responded to that too, to make it clear to people that that's no laughing matter. That's actually, you're going online and, and admitting to, to a potential crime when you talk about that. And, and so it's important for people to understand that that kind of thing is never tolerated. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, Secretary, um, can you talk a little bit more about um, absentee voting and, 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 uh, and maybe some of the problems that people have had with signatures or uh, being unverified? Um, I don't know, yeah. I've seen in Florida, it looks like some minorities and younger voters had more of their ballots rejected based on signature issues. I just want to know if that was something you're seeing in Ohio. Well, the most common error is people leaving their signature off that. I think the next thing is uh, date of birth or wrong identification number or not putting an identification number on there. But again, in Ohio, there's this really thoughtful process that allows for seven days after the election for that curing process to continue. And so that will be going on. 
uh, again for the next seven days beginning tomorrow. And, and it has been going on for four weeks already. As the boards of elections get a ballot in, if there's a problem, they contact the voter. Because of that process, I think that Ohio creates much uh, greater opportunity to fix the problem. Uh, again, those are the kind of things that we anticipate. Absentee voting for somebody that's done it for the first time, you know, it, it involves a few extra steps. And again, I talked about the silver lining of recruiting new poll workers. One of the other silver linings I hope that comes out of this experience that we've all been living through is that we've got more people now that have tried absentee voting for the first time and said, hey, that works out pretty well. I want to do that again. This is why we've also been really encouraging people to track their ballot. Uh, if you saw the absentee ballot request forms that we sent out to 8 million registered voters, we prominently featured on there voteohio.gov slash track so you can go there and see if your ballot's been received in the public service announcements that we did and I think every media appearance that I've done over the last several months we, we were telling people to use voteohio.gov slash track and so I think because of those safeguards in place then uh, you know the, we've come a long way now as you know I've long been a fan of, of creating an online request process that's something that we'll have to do here at the State House. I've been asking for that since I served in the State Senate five years ago uh, and that would be another good step forward to help again further improve and modernize the process but Ohio has a very good absentee voting process again uh, the Brookings Institution a nonprofit nonpartisan think tank very highly regarded international think tank, uh, they evaluated all 50 states. And among the states that do absentee voting, where you request a ballot and then they mail you one, Ohio was ranked top out of all of those states. And again, that's something we're proud of, but we never don't rest on our laurels. There's, there's always more that we can do. So. Thank you. Could yes, you sir. characterize turnout today and then touch on turnout today, statewide, yeah. and then explain for a little bit about how fast the tabulation may go this evening since we did have such an incredible number of people voting early. Yeah. When they start that tabulation, we're talking instead of waiting until 11 or 12, maybe at least half of the tabulation starting at eight or nine. Is that correct? You know, I'm not gonna make or a- wishful thinking. <laughs> what's that? I'm not gonna make a firm prediction on how quick tabulation will go. I'll say this, that uh, all of our boards of elections are eager to get that done. Uh, they've all been putting in a long day, and, and of course, uh, elections run on caffeine, as you know, but even that runs out after a certain period of time. Uh, the boards of elections, what they're never going to do is sacrifice accuracy for speed. Uh, I can tell you, having observed a lot of boards of elections and their tabulating process, back when I was a member of the state senate because I was working on elections issues, I started this habit of traveling around and spending election day at different boards of elections and just sort of being a fly on the wall to watch their process. The thoughtfulness and intentionality of our boards of elections is really a sight to behold. These people are very serious about their work and they're gonna make sure that every legally cast ballot that is in as of today will be counted and reported accurately in that unofficial result. And yes, I think it'll go a little bit quicker because we've had such a incredible number of absentee and early votes. Uh, but again, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let the process play out tonight. As it relates to turnout and participation, um, I've got some, some numbers here, and we've been looking at these. As you know, I've got a little wager with the Michigan Secretary of State to try to see which state can have the highest turnout. But more important than that is just the great civic exercise that we're seeing with the high level of participation. The participation in 2008 was 5.7 million, 5.7 million in 2008, an incredibly high number. Uh, 5.6 in 2012, again 5.6 in 2016. I think it's safe to say that we are going to surpass that. Uh, I think that the 3.4 million that have already voted is an incredible number, and I think that uh, there's a chance that we're going to have a record-breaking day in the state of Ohio, all-time record-breaking day uh, for the number of voters participating, and that's something that is nothing but good news. And by the way, again, it exemplifies what I've been saying for weeks, and that is that it's easy to vote in Ohio, and that's something that we're proud of. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joe. Hi. Um, right now, on a website uh, that supports President Trump, Trump trains are being called for in all 88 counties to drive around polling locations after 5 p.m. Um, the, we've seen these Trump trains on highways and stuff throughout Ohio. They, they're calling for them to be in the neighborhood polling locations in those, those vicinities. What are you doing to make sure that uh, the drop boxes are going to be available to everyone, that the traffic congestion isn't going to be so bad that it's going to scare voters away. 
Yeah. Joe, as you know, any of us that have ever been around campaigns know that there's this nervous energy in the final hours where people are looking for any way to express support for their candidate, whether it's waving signs or passing out flyers or whatever else. And of course, uh, you know, people sounds like have come up with a creative way here to express their support for the candidate that they like. Uh, certainly, if that activity gets in the way of people getting to a polling location, then again, that'll have to be addressed by local law enforcement to do proper traffic management to remind people that, you know, the uh, the ingress and egress from a polling location can't be obstructed. But again, if people are simply driving around expressing support for their favorite candidate, that's protected First Amendment activity. What would not be tolerated and what would be dealt with by law enforcement is anything that obstructed or delayed or uh, you know, made it uh, difficult for people to get to a polling location or to drop off their 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 ballot at the at the drop box. So. Are you? Do you have people looking out for this and standing by to make sure that this doesn't impede upon voters being able to get in and out? Well, absolutely, fifty six thousand of them. I mean, it, and what I mean by that is it starts with those precinct elections officials, the voting location manager at each location. Uh, the, the voting location manager doesn't just sit behind a table all day. She 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 steps outside and looks around to make sure things are, are going smoothly in her parking lot. And as you know, in Ohio, we offer curbside voting for people that need that. That's long been an accommodation for the handicap. Uh, goes back to a time when buildings didn't have accessibility, but now it's being used for people that may have symptoms or may have a known exposure or for whatever other reason want to vote curbside. And so the poll workers will be in and out of the polling location, stepping outside and keeping an eye on that kind of thing. Again, certainly we've got a team that's watching social media, um, which tends to be the place where we find out about these kind of things. And then again, law enforcement, our sheriff's deputies, uh, our, our, our municipal and, and local police departments are, are watching. They know that their responsibilities on election day includes the safety uh, and access to polling locations that was laid out in that memo that I sent to law enforcement bodies close to a month ago and so uh, again uh, if people are out there expressing their support for their candidate that's a fine thing if anybody's getting in the way of voters coming and going then you know hopefully a friendly reminder hey don't block this entrance or hey why don't you take this over there will be enough but if the friendly reminder doesn't work then maybe law enforcement would have to get involved and that's something that I don't want to say is routine but it's something that we're ready for. Yes, sir. Thanks for taking questions, Secretary. The liberal group called Protect the Results is planning on staging protests at about 10 different Ohio cities tonight should Trump declare victory ahead of definitive results. What will you do if President Trump declares victory without any definitive results in Ohio? Yeah, what I'll do is point to the facts. And again, anyone can declare anything, I suppose, but the facts will speak for themselves. And that's why we've reconfigured our election night reporting website to be more transparent than it's ever been, to really highlight that number of outstanding absentee ballots to make sure people can see that when the folks, so when the voters of Ohio spoke, we're listening. And by the way, that means if they've delivered a, an overwhelming victory to one candidate or another, then yeah, you can probably look at those unofficial election night results and say this is a conclusive result. But if they've delivered a narrow lead to one candidate or the other, and there's still sufficient absentee and provisional ballots that could change that, uh, well then certainly uh, it'll be too early to call. And we'll have to allow the process to play itself out as the law requires in Ohio. Again, every legally cast ballot must be counted period, full stop. It doesn't matter if it's an overseas military voter, maybe one of my old former teammates, or just an Ohioan that waited and cast their ballot at the last minute, and, and it's going to take a few days to arrive at the Board of Elections. Every legally cast ballot must be counted, and if there's an overwhelming result that uh, makes the election night report uh, conclusive and, and, and people are able to, to say, yeah, this, this one's over, uh, well, then, you know, then that, that is what it is. But uh, if it's too close to call, uh, then I'm going to be clear about, listen, the people of Ohio are speaking and they're not done yet. How's that? Yes, sir. There were some uh, reports this morning on uh, social media about problems with curbside voting in Cuyahoga County. Could you address that? Yeah, so we found out about this, actually, I think it was Andrew's uh, Twitter feed that we, we first found out about it on uh, when a voting rights group um, had shared it on a, on a conference call. Honestly, that was a little disappointing because these same voting rights groups are people that we have constant communication with and we're in close, you know, have close working relationships with because, again, their mission is our mission, making sure every vote can be cast in a free and fair election. 
Um, and so we were disappointed to sort of hear that it was raised in a conference call and then reported on social media by a member of the journal journalism community before it was sort of reported to us. But again, uh, we don't really have any other information about it other than what we've seen. We called Cuyahoga County Board of Elections as we always do. We've got a constant line of communication with these boards of elections. But uh, uh, again, it doesn't appear to us that there's certainly any systemic problem with curbside voting. It, you know, curbside voting has been part of the law in Ohio for a long time. Chances are we're seeing more of it this year than we've seen in the past. And in that instance, it, you know, maybe if one person is being served by the, the, the designated team of poll workers, then, uh, then, then somebody else may have to wait for a few minutes. That's to be expected. But uh, from what we can tell, curbside voting is going smoothly throughout the state. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Secretary. Um, the, apparently, the, the lines at the drop boxes, I'm wondering if someone's in line at 730, but the line extends beyond the BOE's um, parking lot. Um, will, um, will everybody who's in line, yeah. no matter how long the line goes off the, the property, will, will boards of elections keep those lines open? until everybody gets through the Dropbox line? Yeah, the, the short answer is yes, and, and we were clear about this back in the primary. And as you know, you know the, 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 um, the expansion of Dropboxes that we did this year means that every county board of elections now has one. That wasn't the case just several months ago, but now every county board of elections has them. And so that, that question came up in the spring. Uh, just like anybody who's in line at a polling location at 7.30 gets to vote, anybody who's in line to drop off a ballot at a uh, Board of Elections uh, secure drop box at 730 will get to drop off their ballot. And, and by the way, I do want to point out your mask because today, uh, of course, is kind of a, a cool day uh, given that this is the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage and something that's really worth celebrating. And so thank you for pointing that out. For the record, it says voting like a girl since 1920. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Secretary of State. Good. Are you? Um, the, you've observed the uh, early voting uh, since it's, when it started October 6 to this time. You probably must have uh, received feedback, um, especially from the New American community. Uh, do you have any message for that community? And, uh, well, Dave, as you know, we stood in this room several months ago at a naturalization ceremony. One of the most moving and emotional things anybody can ever be a part of. And I think that uh, many of us who were born as American citizens don't have the same depth of appreciation for really what a profound thing it is to vote as those who had to earn their American citizenship and many of the readers of, uh, of your publication uh, are, are, are among those. Um, for those that are first time voters this year, congratulations, welcome to our big American family. Thank you so much for being a part of the process. We hope that you continue to be a voter for many years to come. Uh, we also know that for, uh, and again, this is the age old American story. This was my family's story 90 years ago when my great grandfather came from Italy. Uh, for people for whom English is the second language, sometimes you know the, the language on the ballot can be a little bit hard to, to read. And so uh, wherever possible, we try to have bilingual uh, elections officials. That's why we asked the question on the recruiting form right there where it says, do you have any additional language proficiency? So that where possible, people that have additional language proficiency can be placed at polling locations where that could come in handy. And as you know, in many counties in Ohio, there are requirements for bilingual ballots that, uh, uh, that of course, are observed by our county boards of elections. And so uh, when we say every American citizen who's registered to vote deserves to cast a ballot, that's exactly what we mean. And uh, it's really something to celebrate when a new American gets to be a part of that process. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Secretary. Yes, sir. Uh, Ohio recorded a uh, record number of COVID cases today, over 4,000. Um, have you had any or heard of any issues of people not wearing masks at the poll? And what does that number of 4,000 cases in the middle of a huge election mean to you? Yeah. So what that number means to me is that our preparations were so important. Um, you know, back in the spring when we were first starting to talk about this, I remember saying to our team, when October comes and people start going inside again, I'm no epidemiologist, but it tends to, to be the times that the, that the infection rates can rise. And, and unfortunately, that's exactly what we've seen. Uh, that's why we started taking this seriously from the very beginning. 
uh, we didn't look the other way and, and hope that this would go away. We started making the preparations necessary. I mean, thousands of gallons of hand sanitizer, millions of masks out at polling locations. This 61 point uh, health guidance, if you haven't seen it yet, it's uh, something to behold. I'm actually quite proud of it. It's a checklist. And maybe this is from my time in the military, but I'm a big fan of checklists. I think it's a great way to, to take a complex set of tasks and organize it into a sort of an easy to work from document. And this, these bullet points in here. The boards of elections have been following those checklists. They've been using the PPE that they have to create a safe and healthy environment at their polling locations. My bottom line to people has been this. If you feel comfortable going to your grocery store, you should feel comfortable coming to your polling location. Um, many of the same health and safety protocols, in fact, and many more. Some of you were with me up at Delaware County on Sunday where we were demonstrating. We, we walked through sort of a mock polling location and showed visually those preparations and, uh, and that was something important for people to see so that they could be reassured. And of course, if anybody has continuing concerns, if you're immune compromised, or if you're yourself symptomatic, you can vote curbside, and that's one of the great accommodations that we have in Ohio. So truly, in this probably the most complex election we've ever conducted, the most difficult set of circumstances we've ever faced in a presidential election, we found these very creative ways, still working within the framework of, our, of Ohio's law, because again, we don't stop following the law just because there's a pandemic, but working within the framework of our laws and being creative about it, we've been able to create the right accommodations. It also highlights why it was so important that we had ample poll workers. Uh, and, and I gotta tell you, I had to be tough with some of the boards of elections about this throughout the last several months. Uh, many of them said, oh, you know, we, we've got enough. We, we don't need to recruit anymore. And I told them you need to get to that 150% mark. And, and the reason why was because if, as we have seen, there was a spike in the virus, we knew that there could be people calling off or people that, uh, God forbid, became infected and then couldn't, uh, couldn't work. And so having those backup poll workers has been so crucial to make sure that no voter came to a voting location this morning and found the door locked, right? I mean, that's what had happened in some other states way back at the beginning of this pandemic where they just didn't have enough poll workers. You can't open a polling location with no poll workers. And so having the, uh, the correct number of poll workers has been such a focus from the very beginning for that reason. Yes, sir. Hi there. I have another question about the outstanding ballot count. The sure. ballot count. Um, just pulled up the live results page and looks really, really good. Um, the ballots are broken down by county. Um, is it going to be broken down at the end of the night or eventually uh, per the congressional district races or the state legislative races or just by county? Thank you. So uh, if you look at the, the website that, that we have, you can look at historic results from past elections. That's exactly how it'll be reported again this year. And it goes into quite granular detail. Of course, what you will see tonight in many cases will be much more top line numbers uh, as we do that unofficial canvas tonight. Uh, but in the final tabulation, when we release those official certified results uh, at the end of the month, uh, that's when you'll be able to drill down into a much more detailed uh, analysis of uh, not only county by county and district by district, but also methodologies, early votes versus absentee votes versus in-person election day votes and, and that kind of thing. So I have another question about the absentee ballot count. Will you be releasing that data in chunks or all at once? Yeah, so uh, as far as the number of outstanding absentee ballots? Um, no, when they're, once they're counted at 731, once they start being counted. It's really all aggregated together. As the counties are reporting, again, the very first numbers that you're gonna see in most cases, it may say zero precincts reporting, but you may see ballots already in. Those are those, in, those early votes and those absentee votes. Again, in, in most cases, those will be the very first ones counted. It's intuitive why. The bipartisan teams that are still tearing down the polling locations haven't even loaded up in the car to bring them down to the Board of Elections yet, but right at 731, they begin with those early and absentee voting. But as far as when you look at those county numbers and sort of being able to parse out these are provision or these are uh, absentees and, and these are in person, you won't be able to do that with the, with the uh, sort of unofficial election night results as they're accumulating. But again, the, the, the final reports will definitely give you that, that level of granular detail. Okay, so, thank you. Yep, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I, um, we, I know you had a question about uh, curbside voting, but we've been hearing in Franklin County in particular that a lack of signage is an issue, okay. and that there are some polling locations where curbside voting is not available. Have you, Secretary, heard anything specific to Franklin County and what might be done about that? 
No, haven't, but uh, as soon as I walk back over to the office, that'll be one of the first calls that we make. In fact, I'm probably a member of my team is texting our, our, our election operations room right now about that. Uh, as far as signage goes, this was something that we actually did this year as well, though, that's worth pointing out. Uh, we used some of the, the dollars that became available to us to, to purchase standardized signage for the whole state. So if you go out to a polling location, you'll see sort of the A-frame or what I call a sandwich board sign that lists not only the, the COVID accommodations, uh, but also the fact that there's curbside voting available. You'll also see yard signs, just sort of these coroplast yard signs that can go in the flower bed or in the grass leading up that remind people to wear a mask, maintain distance, and also of the available availability of curbside voting. Now, here's what I didn't do. I didn't micromanage how each county was gonna do curbside voting because 88 different counties, a very diverse state. I wanted to allow the boards of elections some flexibility because it is logistically challenging. When you're running a polling location, you may have a line of people to sort of take people and, and send them outside with a clipboard and the right PPE to do the curbside voting. But many counties though, they, they put a place to phone number on those Coroplast signs or on those uh, A-frame signs. We built them to accommodate that. And it says, call this number. And let's be honest, most of us have a mobile phone. Not everybody does, but call this number if you want to access curbside voting. There's also the traditional way, which again, yep. Curbside voting has been available for decades, long before any of us ever had a cell phone. Uh, and, and in those days, the, the way you would simply do it is flag down a fellow voter, sort of yell out the window, hey, I need to curbside vote, would you tell the poll workers inside? It's, a, you know, it's not the most uh, fancy way to do it, but it works, and especially with a presidential election with a pretty you know, steady flow uh, coming and going, uh, that, that methodology works to alert the team inside that you need to curbside vote. Some county boards of elections actually had volunteers like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and 4-H members and that kind of thing standing outside spotting for curbside voters as well. So, Are there regulations as to where those signs have to be to make th that they're visible? Yeah, not regulations, but suggestions. Of course, common sense applies. Again, with four, close to 4,000 polling locations, they are very different. There are urban locations where the, the building comes right up to the sidewalk and then right up to the street. There are locations that are in a huge parking lot. There are locations that are, you know, uh, way out in, an, in a rural area. I mean, every, sort of everything you can imagine uh, if you go to these different polling locations. I've been to a lot of them that are on fairgrounds, for example, or whatever else. So what we've given is guidance that it should be visible between where people park or get off a bus, so where people sort of first access the site and the door, that's where we wanted to place those signs so it's a visible from the parking area, right, but also visible for those as they're walking in. Again, that's the guidance we've given them. We're, we're, we're not, we can't, I mean, it's just logistically impossible to micromanage exactly where to place those signs, though. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Adrian. We continue to get reports of longer lines. I know you've touched on this a little bit, and obviously with technical issues, these lines are getting longer. What's your recommendation to voters as we get closer and closer to that time that polls are closing, if they are waiting in an extreme long line? Yeah. Well, a couple things about lines. First of all, it's important for people to understand that when a line is socially distanced, it's going to look longer than it really is. Again, in some places there are legitimately uh, you know, lines that are taking a, a little bit of time, but a six foot social distance line looks a lot longer than we're accustomed to. Normally people stand about 18 inches apart, nobody would be doing that today. Um, and so don't be, dis don't be discouraged. If you show up and see a line that looks long, it may be moving a lot faster. In fact, this is one of the things where we got advice from Cedar Point, the amusement park company, that was part of our Ready for November task force, these Zoom meetings that many of you watched us do that was uh, broadcast on the Ohio Channel. And thanks, by the way, to our team from the Ohio Channel for doing that and for doing this today. Um, the, the amusement park folks reminded us of a method that they use, and we've all been there in line at the, at the amusement park where it says, it, you'll be on the ride in 20 minutes or whatever else. That's reassuring, right? Because otherwise people might lose, lose hope. And so what we've told the boards of elections to do is to place signage if they can, or if nothing else, send a poll worker out there to walk the line every now and then to, to check in with people, to remind them that, that they'll be inside within 20 or 30 minutes to give them that reasonable expectation. The other thing is don't wait, right? It's the middle of the afternoon right now. If you're if your schedule, if your work schedule, if your family schedule and school schedule allows it, uh, get out to the polling location as soon as you can. We're in a traditionally slower period here in the middle, middle afternoon. There tends to be an increase uh, right after work 
Uh, and so, you know, beat that rush by getting out there right now uh, to cast your ballot. And certainly anybody who's in line will not be turned away. Of course, dress appropriately, um, you know, dress for the elements and, and that kind of thing. Although it's a beautiful day out there, just a little bit windy and a little bit chilly. Uh, but, you know, be ready to stand in an outdoor line. And let's be kind to one another. Let's be patient to one another. If there's an elderly person, try to help them to the front of the line. Somebody with mobility challenges, try to help them, let them get to the front. You know, just reasonable common sense, the things that Ohioans do because we're, we're kind and patient people and, and, and tend to treat each other with respect. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you do. Let me, let me mention that. I mean, the, the founders could have never imagined the situation that we're finding, finding ourselves in, running an election in the midst of a pandemic and, and all the other things, but uh, they did know that an informed electorate was necessary uh, for a functioning democracy, and so they created the very first amendment to protect the work that you all do, and I, for one, appreciate it. So thank you for keeping Ohioans informed with accurate information throughout the day and throughout the evening and uh, at 7.30 tonight when the polls close, then uh, the people of Ohio get to know that their voice was heard and we will respect that and report the results as quickly as we can and make sure again that every legally cast ballot will be counted because again, as Lincoln said, the elections belong to the people. We're just the caretakers of that and making sure that it runs honestly. Thank you so much everybody, take care.